Hi all, thank you, Megan. Um, so thanks for having me here tonight as part of your community, honestly. I mean, I think what I saw from those quotes at the beginning of things that you all contributed to the dialogue before it even started, I'm so inspired. Um, so thank you all for, for that, for inspiring me tonight. Um, in my role at the 1027 Healing Partnership, we're a community resiliency organization that was started after the shooting at Tree of Life. Um, that's been referenced here a few times tonight. And so, you know, what do we do in, in that? We understand a little bit of um, how trauma impacts communities. We look at the ways in which we heal, the ways in which we grow, um, and the ways in which we also feel the, the pain or the discomfort of all of the, you know, acts of hatred. So um, we work really closely with a lot of different people um, in doing that. And so what I'll talk about a little bit tonight is some of what we do and the ways in which we um, we sort of believe that resiliency happens, part of it is education, right? When something happens, we can't prevent bad things from happening. We can't stop bad things from happening. In fact, like that is part of our human experience. But what we can do is we can change the way we respond to them. And it matters so much in terms of communities being prepared for whatever's next. When we have a moment in time, that we stop and we take a look around and we see who's with us. Um, and that's why I was very inspired at the beginning for the Christian leaders of the community co-writing a prayer, uh, a, a sort of a meditation for everybody to, to hold together. Um, that's that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about, about resiliency. They, they did that together in response tonight. And what we know about communities when they've been impacted is that that means that we they can do it again in the future. Um, and the leadership that Megan and Robert have taken tonight, you know, that that we know that your community in Aetna has the capacity to respond. Um, and that's really inspirational to me. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen for a second. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about, um, about the, you know, the what does that mean? What does it all mean? Um, so I talk a lot about, um, trauma, the impacts of trauma. And sometimes I think about trauma, like I said, it's a given human condition. It's sometimes it's a pressure test. So the buildings and bridges around us, when they undergo inspections, we look for weaknesses. We look for the cracks. We look for, for where we may see a future failure. Um, and so when there's a structural issue, you, you attend to it. You make sure that it's, it's taken care of. But communities are the same that these moments where there's these cracks, where people are feeling targeted, vulnerable, unsafe, um, when they see something that feels like it is untenable, the question is that at that moment in that pressure test, what does the community do? Um, and what we're talking about today is really that you all made a choice in that moment to come together, to show up tonight, to call each other, to show up at each other's houses, to talk to to other people. Um, and so what comes out of that is post-traumatic growth. And we'll talk more about trauma, but I wanted to start with this conversation, especially because what we just heard from, from Sean, especially some of those visuals, um, the event at Tree of Life on October 27th, 2018 was horrific. It was unthinkable and it was horrific. And what we learned from that is that we need to make sure we're all more attuned to violent extremism within our city here in Pittsburgh, we have to be very aware. And so that's exactly what happened. Robert, you know, very bravely said what Aetna responded to on October 27th, how they came together, and then how that applies today to having a purpose statement. That's post-traumatic growth. That was that initial impact of that trauma, that as a community, there's been growth already. There's been new relationships. There's been the ability to organize. There's already posters that were created that remind us that everyone's here together. Um, but I think that it's really important that remembering that um, that after a traumatic event, it can feel sometimes like it is just subsuming us and we are, we are underneath it. But also when we look around, there's opportunities for new connections. There's opportunities to learn something about both ourselves, but also mm -hmm. other people around us, as long as we're looking. And so when we're talking tonight, I want everybody to sort of think about what are we looking for in each other? How do we reach out? How do we build these relationships um, that, that already existed? And what Mary Ellen said about the work that happened into becoming an eco district and the way that Robert reworded those things, those are so inspiring to me. Um, just really, really beautiful. 
So what is trauma? Just so that we can all sort of know we're talking about the same thing here, that trauma is a given human condition, right? It is not something that they experience or someone else experiences. We, as humans, are equipped for trauma and it is unpleasant, it is hard, it is isolating, it feels very lonely. Um, but an incident becomes traumatic when it disrupts our sense of self and safety. So importantly, I think that, you know, sometimes we don't understand exactly what we're talking about. And so it's hard to be resilient when we don't understand what trauma is. Trauma is something that has disrupted my sense of self and safety. Um, primary trauma means it was my experience. Like I, I had an experience, secondary trauma, empathize with someone else's trauma. So somebody else had an experience, I heard about it, and I start to notice the impacts on me as though it had happened to me. Vicarious trauma is what we call sort of a near miss. It's when we feel as though something, we, that, there was that car accident, it was just one car ahead of us, but that night we keep thinking about it, we keep thinking about it. Most importantly, trauma impacts our thinking and it can have lasting effects. Not everybody, not always, but any of these three forms of trauma can have lasting effects. They actually all produce the same biological response. And so when we're talking about the hate flag appearing in a neighborhood, a safe neighborhood, feeling safe and then feeling unsafe in that moment, right? That fear that we experience is real. Um, and the question is like, why does it impact some people in one way and other people in another? It may be because somebody had uh, event themselves that it brings back up to the surface. Some people realize that, um, you know, that they felt close to a person who had significant loss, whatever it is. Um, but when traumatic events happen, one of the things that happens is it brings to the surface a lot of the time past experiences. And so some people, you know, would minimize. And I think Laura just did an incredible job at describing why we don't minimize hate speech, we, we don't minimize signs of hatred in the community. Um, and the reason why personally a number of people feel that impact is that it brings to the surface feelings of unsafety, feelings of targeted, being you know concerned that because of who they are, they may not be safe where they are. Um, and so when there's a trauma, one of the things is to normalize that, that that's a real experience. Everybody defines it for themselves. And if you're a family member, if you're a friend, if you're a neighbor, that that one of the things that we often do is well why is it bothering you so much we'll ask that or will we will sometimes minimize somebody's experience but remembering that that post-traumatic growth happens because we actually do feel close to something and then we take a lesson we think about it and we really figure out what we do about that and so i would challenge all of you guys to think a little bit with traumatic events where fear comes in um, and then also how do we see the fear that other people are experiencing and what can we do to try and change that, to try to help them. Really quickly, I think it's important to kind of talk about what collective trauma is, because I think that's really what I heard Megan and Robbie, you know, responding to when I first talked to them about this. But the idea that the community in Aetna has worked really hard to create some communal norms, values, and things that are important. Um, and so when there's a trauma that's kind of a collective trauma, it can shatter our sense of who we are. Um, and it can strengthen it over time because that's what post-traumatic growth is. But that shared experience can alter the narrative and the psyche of a group. And so one of the things that to notice is that when we have a communal trauma, um, we wanna notice the ways in which when we put our, our umbrellas up, <laughs> um, we may not make space for other people or we may you know, be in judgment of other people. And so my hope is that you know, with everything that you guys are doing tonight, that it tells me that this community is really equipped to see, understand trauma, to also see and find opportunities for post-traumatic growth um, and to find opportunities to, to see each other differently, to try and, um, and to open up sort of the ways of love, the way that you know the, the five faith leaders talked to us about at the beginning, the ways that we can look for love to grow um, and to really combat hate through that love. So thank you for having me and I look forward to continued partnership and learning from your community.